Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to How the Media Gets Trans Coverage Wrong. I am your host for this session, Catherine Alejandra Cross. I am a PhD candidate at the University of Washington studying uh, information science and looking in particular at online harassment for my sins. But to move right along, we have an excellent panel of some very, very fine experts indeed, a couple of whom it has been my pleasure to know and one of whom I was very gratified to meet for the purposes of this panel whose work I have loved. Let me introduce them to you. So today we have with us Jude Ellison S. Doyle, an author, columnist, and comic book writer living in upstate New York. Under his former pen name, Sadie Doyle, Jude is the author of Trainwreck, The Women We Love to Hate, Mock, and Fear, and Why, and Dead Blondes and Bad Mothers, Monstrosity, Patriarchy, and the Fear of Female. In 2021, Jude published More, a five-issue limited uh, limited series horror comic with artist A.L. Kaplan for Boom Studios. The collected edition was published in August of 2022. His second limited series, The Neighbors, wrapped up in July 2023, and the collected edition is expected in January 2024. He writes a weekly column for Medium. Devin Price is a social psychologist, professor at Loyola University of Chicago, and the author of the books Laziness Does Not Exist, Unmasking Autism, and the forthcoming Unlearning Shame. And last, but most certainly not least, Julia Serrano is an Oakland, California-based writer, performer, biologist, and activist. She is the author of five books, including Whipping Girl, A Transsexual Woman on Sexism and the Scapegoating of Femininity, and her latest, Sexed Up, How Society Sexualizes Us and How We Can Fight Back. Julia's other writings have appeared in over 20 anthologies and in media outlets like the New York Times, The Guardian, Times Salon, Daily Beast, Alternate, Out, and Ms. For more about her various endeavors, go to juliaserrano.com. So let's dive straight into it. You know, I think it's quite fair to say that the media landscape, especially, although not exclusively in English language media, is either anti-trans or vigorously platforming anti-trans voices in the name of sort of false balance in covering the issues of the trans community. Certainly in the case of the British media, there's been an almost wholesale institutional capture by anti-trans moral panic. And yet as recently as 2014, there was a sense that we were at a trans tipping point, her famous headline in Time magazine, one that heralded a new age of acceptance. But in the nearly decades since, we've reached kind of a nadir of moral panic, urged on by large sections of even liberal press. So big question, I know, but how did that happen and why in your estimation? Um, I guess I'll go first. <laughs> uh, I think there were a whole bunch of different forces that all came together to conspire to make that happen. As someone who was already an established writer about trans issues when the tipping point happened, I would almost say that there was somewhat of a trend where the media kind of had ignored trans people for a long time. And then suddenly there were all these TV shows and movies and stories about trans children. And the media acted as though they had to catch up to that. And so that was the only time in my life for a couple year period where mainstream publications would actively reach out to me without me doing anything and saying, hey, would you like to write for us about trans stuff? And that was going on for a couple of years. Most of those stories were positive. Um, and then there was a backlash that happened, again, for a number of reasons. A lot of it was very coordinated anti-trans activism, particularly around 2015 to 2016, a mixture of social conservatives, um, so-called gender critical or TERFs, um, people who have anti-trans feminist views, um, something that rarely gets talked about, but there's a huge anti-trans parent movement that's much like the anti-trans vax movement of parents trying to seek out their own information. And then they stumble onto a lot of tra anti-trans, trans skeptical stuff. And then there's some uh, establishment uh, gatekeepers and so on, um, medical gatekeepers who still hold anti-trans views. And all of that kind of came together to slowly create, you know, moral panic in, in, in the media particularly, where there was certainly something wrong with all these trans people suddenly appearing. And there weren't trans kids 20 years ago, were there? Question mark. And so 
it was very much coordinated is is important, but also um, just feeding on a sense, the perpetual sense that trans people are a novel phenomenon that always needs to be explained. Right, and if I can uh, jump off the jump off that, the media does not have a really good immune system when it comes to dealing with this kind of misinformation, because there are very few trans reporters who have been around in the issue long enough to know who these you know hate groups are, or they're. There are plenty of trans reporters, but they're not typically employed at these big legacy publications. So you have most recently and most sort of horrifyingly, the New York Times feeling that in the interests of fair coverage or impartial coverage, they need to give equal airtime to you know both sides of this issue. And the anti-trans groups are incredibly coordinated. They're very good at playing the game and they know how to, you know, reach out and say, well, I'm just a concerned parent. And by the way, all of my concerns happen to come from this organization. You don't necessarily need to credit them or say that I'm aligned with them when you publish this on the front page of the New York Times. Right. So it's really easy for misinformation to sneak into the mainstream because we are not comfortable with allowing trans people who just on a practical level are a little bit more able to identify the misinformation. We're not comfortable allowing us to write those narratives. And we also just like the, the level of education is so low that it's really easy for a bad actor to sneak on into the mainstream. In some cases, some of these reporters are actively facilitating that, right? You know, we can all name a few reporters who have actively tried to sort of sandpaper off you know the trademark and just push anti-trans talking points into the mainstream but i genuinely believe that a lot of the reporters that are publishing this are just publishing it because they don't know better and it sounds like they're being fair if they you know quote enough people from both sides yeah yeah um and and that speaks to exactly what i wanted to say um it, it's a very coordinated uh series of of hate groups that have tried to kind of seed a lot of the the discourse on this subject, but it's also been platformed by journalists, um, specific ones in a very deliberate way. Um, I think many of us who care about this issue remember the Atlantic piece when your child says they're transgender. That piece uh, profiled a number of so-called, and we'll talk about this more later, um, detransitioned people, but they were all actually detransitioned people who knew each other and were part of a coordinated turf movement. And we only know about that now because there's people who've left that movement like Kai Shevers, who also writes on Medium, by the way, who's talked about how this was a coordinated effort to reach journalists who were already critical of trans people to kind of lay down the groundwork of fomenting a lot of fear and misinformation. And then it found its way in the hand of legislators who were all too happy to kind of also feed on that, um, that ideology. Um, and the only thing that I'll say to kind of build on um, what Jude and Julia already both said is that the trans tipping point, as much as I'm someone who benefited from it, um, someone who transitioned after it, um, it was, um, in terms of media reception, it was a movement, I think, of personal identity rather than collective liberation, or really talking about the policy demands that we need to make as a marginalized class and what some of the healthcare um, needs that we have that we have in common with other groups, including detransitioners, including you know women with a polycystic ovarian system uh, syndrome, lots of other conditions. Uh, you know, instead, it was just a very kind of personal identity, celebration of personal identity, making people as individuals more visible uh, kind of movement. And visibility is not necessarily uh, liberation. A lot of times it's vulnerability and putting a target on your back. So to that end, I wanted to talk a bit about uh, what do you think the incentives are for like liberal leaning publications to have indulged in this you know sort of the point that you make devon about visibility is an excellent one for sure and it's one that i thought a great deal about as a trans woman you know for many years there was a lot of discourse about how oh, trans women were very hyper visible but what does that mean in practice and so forth and we started to really see the the dark wages of that but how is it that you know sort of more liberal publications like the New York Times or the Guardian have been kind of seduced or taken in by the terrible logic of this moral panic. I guess I could start again. <laughs> um, 
So I, again, I think that there are multiple forces that are conspiring. I, one thing that I will say is that having once again been around for a very long time, the idea that like being pro-trans is a liberal position is very, very new with regards to mainstream politics. Um, basically, <laughs> trans people across the political spectrum have been largely ignored and often demonized or sensationalized. So I think it's with during the 2010s, along with the uh, garnering uh, more approval of same sex marriage, that people saw like being liberal as being pro trans. So, again, this it's a very new position. I think a lot of I think there, there are different reasons in different cases. In the case of the New York Times, and there's been some reporting on this, that that it seems like they're purposefully trying to court conservatives. Um, people have talked about this with regards to a couple of different issues. Um, the articles and op-eds that the New York Times is putting out now compared to five years ago, um, they definitely have an increasingly conservative bent. Um, in other cases, I, I think that there are some people who are generally concerned if enough people over and over again say that there are too many trans kids transitioning, you know, what's going on with that? What's going on with, oh, we found a detransition person. What's going on with that? it's really easy to ferment um, genuine fear or, or concern out of people who just don't know that better. And as Jude was pointing out um, in the previous question, uh, there are just, there's just a lot of a lack of awareness and it's really easy for us people who are, are in the know because we're trans or we're involved in um, you know, trans healthcare or whatever uh, to know who the bad actors are, but most people don't. And most people, if you talk about, hey, there's a study published that raises some questions, if you don't know about the hundred other studies that have shown that gender affirming care is very efficacious and that gender disaffirming approaches are very harmful, if you don't know all of that background, then that one, you know, ROGD paper that comes out and raises everyone's concerns, it's just real easy uh, to prey on that. Yeah, and this is something where um, my previous experience, actually, of all things covering reproductive rights has been really useful for me understanding this, because I think that we fail to understand the precise ways in which I think the British turf movement is taking shape in a different way than the US movement, which is really tied to the Christian right, which is really tied to the worldwide push against so called gender ideology. And Gender ideology doesn't just mean like trans people exist, trans people can transition. Gender ideology means birth control. Gender ideology means abortion. Gender ideology means anything other than the patriarchal heterosexual nuclear family. And it's deeply tied to like racism and anxiety about white birth rates and anti-Semitism. And if you dig into it, it's a real deep rat king of Nazi bullshit, you know, just to skip past the professional uh the professional language but because again this is exactly what happened with abortion in the 70s and 80s on because republicans are driving so hard on that as like this is our thing this is what we care about this is our culture our main thing that we do every day is wake up and be upset about trans kids a publication like the new york times or like the washington post where a lot of their reputation depends on their being willing to take an objective or impartial position, they're going to feel not only motivated, but obliged to publish some of that. And that's when it becomes very, very easy for, again, just bad faith hate groups to start slipping things into the mainstream. Yeah, and the only thing I would add beyond what Julia and Jude had to say is that just um, just look at the incentive structure. I think a lot of times these kinds of articles, they generate a lot of attention. They generate a lot of clicks um, in a time when that's just, you know, every every journalistic outlet is, is fighting to to stay alive and, and bring in revenue. Um, and so, of course, courting conservatives and also getting a lot of uh, outrage bait from the rest of us is is often, you know, really beneficial. And, and Julia was right to draw the parallel with the anti-vax movement, you know. Um, if the media was for too long treating whether vaccines cause autism as a controversy when the, the data was very clear on that, um, it really shouldn't be surprising that they would follow the same 
model and be too slow to change on, you know, other similar controversies or controversies, you know, falsely generated controversies that tick off a lot of the same fears people have about kind of othered bodies and medical intervention and things like that. Yes, and speaking of that sort of thing, one of the recurring motifs in the moral panic has been the press sort of channeling this anxiety, whether sincere or cynical or some combination of both about detransitioners, those people who took significant steps to medically transition genders but then reverted to their starting gender. And so why is this and how might the story of this real but rare phenomenon be better served? by the press. So uh, I should say, since we're with this is Medium Day, my most recent Medium article is called Spotting Anti-Trans Bias on Detransition. Mm -hmm. And I go to a lot there, including like delving into the statistics of detransition and regret, um, talking about uh, dynamic transgender tra trajectories that sometimes involve people detransitioning or deciding, hey, I'm non-binary now. Um, and all of that. The one thing that I feel that is really important as I was working on it is, even though detransition is a very complex phenomenon and people detransition for lots of reasons, including pressure from family, societal transphobia, um, the one thing that comes up over and over again is it seems like audiences and journalists really gravitate towards what I call in the piece the mistaken and regretted detransition or the mistaken and regretted transition. And this really preys on um, two biases that cisgender people generally have, which is one, they just assume everyone's cisgender. So when people are transgender, they tend to assume that we're merely confused or deluded cisgender people. And the second one is people tend to see, and this is true of all dominant majority groups, um, but with regards to cisgender versus transgender, cisgender is constructed as natural and pure, and transgender is viewed as artificial, defective, and corrupted. So when you take that together, when people hear about someone detransitioning, they often jump to the conclusion that, oh, see, they really were a cisgender person who realized that they were just confused or deluded, and now they must regret what happened to them because God, what what worse could happen to you than, you know, being a cisgender person trapped in a transgendered body, which I kind of took that phrase from the more uh, typical cliche that a lot of people are familiar with. But I think it immediately resonates with people and people immediately jump to the conclusion when you say detransition, even though I know lots of people who have detransitioned for all sorts of different life reasons, that is the conclusion they jump to and that conclusion very much plays into the idea that transitioning itself, especially for trans youth, must be suspect and and uh, and dangerous. Yeah, I think that um, that is a very real instinctual reaction or, you know, maybe not actually instinctual, but, you know, this, this knee jerk reaction that a lot of uh, cis people have to the idea of detransition. Um, and it also, again, bears mentioning that there was a very coordinated attack on the part of uh, TERFs, first of all, to recruit um, and conversion therapy. Um, primarily trans masculine people into being members of their movement and into being the faces of transition regret. Um, and even some of like, those people, again, who have been really prominent voices in that movement have already desisted from the detransitioner turf movement and recognized it as a hate group uh, that it is and been outspoken now again about the role that they once played in advancing transphobic uh, legislation and how much they regret that. People like Carrie Callahan, people like Kai Shevers and, and other people um, in the group Health Liberation Now, if anyone's curious about that. Um, that that was part of how, you know, a, a maybe understandable and understandable given the the understanding of, of gender that most cis people have, that those fears that they have, it was really taken advantage of and put to use by a really coordinated attack and one that even did get some, some trans people in the loop and weaponized them and they also played an active role in it to a certain extent. Jude, do you have any thoughts? Um, I actually, I think that everyone else has covered this a lot. And I'll say that again, the detransition regret, it's, it's, it has to do a lot with the ease of sneaking medical misinformation into mm -hmm. the mainstream when you don't have reporters who have actually 
you know, done research, any trans person pretty much has to do a lot of their own independent research to figure out what healthcare they need, you know? So if somebody comes up to you and says, my nine-year-old requested top surgery yesterday and the doctor just gave it to him, you know, I am pretty easily able to identify that as something that probably didn't happen. But it's, you know, it it's something that because it relates to care of the body and because it relates to care of like intimate parts of the body that scare people to talk about anyway, a lot of people are just like really comfortable publishing flat out false stuff about it. Um, you know, and it was the same thing with abortion. There were all sorts of, you know, quote unquote studies about how abortion gave you cancer and made you suicidally depressed and all of that. You know, it's it's really easy when you're talking about the body to assume a false expertise and just, you know, promulgate. I think that what I really love about what you're saying, Jude, and the connections that you've made, because like you, I also came up through writing about reproductive justice, you know, I wrote for RH Reality Check. Uh, I was part of the reproductive justice movement for many years myself, was uh, seeing these connections, the fact that a lot of this all really sort of hangs together as a political program about denying bodily autonomy, and that the media seems to have a kind of unique vulnerability on these issues due to a lack of expertise or a misapprehension of what science is, where, you know, because there are social and political implications, they end up platforming what they perceive to be both sides of a valid debate. And, you know, they've been hit with this on uh, anti-vax stuff, as you said, on climate change and so forth. Uh, but yeah, I think those, that's all very insightful. And I appreciate everyone else's points about detransitioners. It feels like we could say something, something very similar as well about what's the discourse on women's sports and uh, trans children more broadly. It all kind of feeds back into the same uh, lack of knowledge, sublimated expressions of multiple intersectional prejudices and an unwillingness or an inability to grapple with what the science is actually saying about many of these topics. Uh, and speaking of our various and sundry expertise, uh, given that we're all trans people in relatively visible roles with our own uh, unique skill sets, I wanted to round off this discussion before we moved into the Q&A by talking about what it's like doing this work whilst constantly being pigeonholed as a transgender ex. You know? Julia is a biologist of some note, Jude's a feminist cultural critic, Devon's a psychologist, and I'm some unholy amalgam of sociology, information science, and vodka. We're best defined by our careers rather than our transness, after all. So let's talk a bit about that. How do we balance our responsibilities to the community at large with a need or personal desire to be known first and foremost as professionals, unmodified? And how does the current moment in journalism and wider criticism make that exceptionally challenging. Um, I guess um, for me in particular, being a biologist, I, I guess I have, uh, there are two aspects to this to me. So for one thing, it, in I am not currently practicing as a biologist. I did that for many years. Um, and then I mostly became a writer. As a writer, I write mostly about um, gender, sexuality, and social justice. Although I do sometimes write about science, occasionally about things outside of this issue, but mostly related to trans science because a lot of the people, um, a lot of the journalists doing that work are not doing a very good job of that work. Um, so I don't feel like I'm impacted that much personally in that way. How I am impacted is that particularly on issues, you know, obviously a major um, push of the anti-trans activist movement is the biological sex pushing this idea that um, just basically this really old, you know, it's sex, not gender, which is based on a dichotomy that came out of 1960s and 70s psychology and where that overlapped with feminism and everybody in both those fields have moved beyond it. But um, when it does come up, and when I do say, hey, actually biology and biological sex, it's multifaceted and you know, they're complex traits. And I talk about that, I immediately get shut down by anybody and everybody because obviously I'm just a trans activist. Obviously I couldn't have any insight into biology that isn't 
polluted by the fact that um, I'm a trans activist first and foremost. And we often joke about how in random news stories, um, people refer to trans people as trans activists, even if they're not a trans person who does activism. Um, I do do some activism, so I don't mind trans activists, but um, when they assume that the being a trans activist means that's the only thing that matters, um, I would say that there are actually countless more cisgender activists right now than there are transgender activists. Um, but that's a bias that you see, not just with trans people, but with any marginalized group, where anything you say about your own personal experiences, the dominant majority takes that and says, no, actually, you're the ones who are biased, but we couldn't be biased. So I kind of approach this in two directions because I write about trans topics and I'm a trans person and I also write about autism and I'm an autistic person. Um, and I think a lot of my um, authority flows through actually being in community with a lot of other people of those identities, knowing the, a lot of the diversity of perspectives and the fights that we have with each other and knowing that none of us can be a monolithic representation of what these communities need or, or want. Um, and, you know, that kind of flows in parallel with the authority that I have that is uh, even more dubious, honestly, by, by virtue of having a PhD and being a psychologist and having these credentials that people think of as respectable, um, fairly or unfairly, often very unfairly. Um, and, you know, for me, those things often kind of balance out in a way or synthesize in a way that actually works to my advantage. Um, and I think that is a lot of that is just um, it's part of the way that, you know, how psychology is perceived versus how something like biology is, how, is perceived. And it's also related to me being a man and all kinds of other like uh, intersecting prejudices and how people think about these things. But um, for me, because of those facts and just because of where I'm sitting, um, I've never really wanted to see um, myself as like creating any distance between each of those elements of my identity. Um, I think in psychology, in academia, you are really trained to like be a professional first. If you do any research about anything related to your own lived experience, you're doing me search. And that means you're unprofessional and biased and can't be taken seriously. And you're not a serious academic and all of these things. Um, and I've, uh, I have want nothing to do with that. And I'm very lucky uh, that I have a career where I can be really uh, resistant resistant to that um, and uh, upset a lot of people who would have been my colleagues otherwise if I had kind of stayed on the um, peer reviewed research tenure track kind of path. Um, so, so yes, I think these things are in tension with each other sometimes. It definitely feels uncomfortable when you're tapped for interviews to just be one trans voice or just one autistic voice and things like that. And you have to really push to widen that range and have a variety of different perspectives uh, brought on board when that happens. But um, for the most part, I think my professional identity um, and my identities as a trans person and as an autistic person, they, they are the same thing. The reason that I know a lot about these things is because of my experience in community with other autistic and trans people, uh, not because of my psychological training. Uh, my, my psychological training failed on both counts um, in terms of preparing me to understand either autism or transness. So that's kind of where I see it. Yeah. And I was really excited to hear everybody else's answers before I gave mine because my trajectory is kind of awkward. I was a writer for quite a long time before I came out. And uh, I specifically, like I wrote about trans issues in that I covered gender, but it's been interesting for me to see how that's received when, you know, you are perceived as being like a respectable cis person weighing in on trans issues versus when you're perceived to be a trans person weighing in on trans issues. They take you a lot less seriously. And it sort of ties into this trend of like trans people keep getting published mainly on opinion pages because being trans is perceived as an opinion, as in it is my opinion that I'm trans and someone else gets to say, well, it's my opinion that you're not. Um, so that to me is is a sign that we need to broaden our coverage and understand that being trans shouldn't have to be a beat it is right now because there's a lot a lot of news related to it but it's it's a way of seeing the world and not every trans writer is interchangeable there are for example so many horrifying things going on around sports and trans girls in sports and i literally have not willingly watched a sport on TV since I was maybe seven years old. 
I can't cover that. There are trans sports writers like Frankie De La Cretas who are going to be able to bring something, bring like a lived depth of experience and some actual subject expertise to that. And that's who you need to be tapping. We grow and we broaden our ability to actually cover the news when we allow people to yes, write things that are informed by their identity, because every single thing you think or say or do is informed by your identity to some extent. It's only the most privileged people who have the privilege of their identity not being seen to sway what they, what they say. But don't limit people's writing solely to their identity. Don't trap people in this loop of like, I had been out online for maybe 24 hours when I got my first invitation to debate a turf in a magazine. And I said, no, thank you. You know, like, don't trap people in this loop where they're endlessly justifying their own identities. And that's the only thing they're allowed to write. It leads to burnout and it leads to uninteresting writing. I most certainly agree. And goodness knows, in my own career, I've always worried about like being cast as oh, the transgender sociologist or whatever. Whereas, you know, my broader areas of expertise are about technology as it affects all of us. And it's from that perspective that I write, say, in Wired, when I have written columns there that are devoted to trans issues, it's because, you know, as Devin says, I can't separate that part of myself out and I have an obligation and my own feelings as well about everything that's happening where, you know, I come in and say, well, I can speak to this with some degree of personal authority, but also it's within my ballywick of talking about how this relates to social media and big tech and so on and so forth. Uh, and that's where I feel like I can do the most good. And speaking of uh, continuing to do good, we already have several questions from the audience. So uh, by your leave, I think that we will just dive right into them for the last uh, roughly 15 minutes here. So I'll start with uh, one of the first questions that is uh, listed for us. With the level of education on this issue being so low, how do we go about fixing that authentically? And what is the media's responsibility toward educating with intention? I mean, I think, again, this comes to screening your sources carefully and thoughtfully. If someone is coming at you with a bunch of studies and they all somehow seem to prove that being trans is scary and dangerous, you need to look at who those sources are. You need to do some research on what the most prominent organizations pushing these talking points are. And you need to understand that as a reporter, it is your duty to not publish information that you don't understand without checking with someone who does understand it. There are plenty of clinicians out there in the country, even though it's hard to get interviews with them now because they're constantly getting death threats, but there are plenty of actual medical experts on hormone replacement therapy or you know, top surgery or whatever else you're curious about. And you have the ability to check your information, check it and double check it because you don't want to, I mean, we just lived through a plague. We all know the cost of feeding people incorrect information about their own health. Um, one thing that I, to, to piggyback on that and particularly with regards to trans health, I feel that there's this huge misunderstanding about what science is and kind of the general public and People think that science is people getting this clever idea that goes against the grain and then you publish it and everyone has to take that seriously. And that is not how science works. Science works by consensus. And what happens is people are publishing stuff and if enough different independent groups all seem to start to get the same answer, then that becomes a scientific consensus until or unless new evidence comes along that challenges that. And I feel that, I feel like we're just doing this ping pong where every time there's a new study that comes out, um, all these people are debating about whether it's a good study or a bad study. And no study is perfect, but there's like what gets lost, like the, you know, not seeing the, the forest for the tree or did I get that wrong? I maybe got that one wrong, but 
people don't realize that there's a scientific consensus that's been out there and it's been going on for decades um, regarding trans health. And there are always things that are new and there are always new questions. But I wish people would understand that just because Lisa Littman publishes a paper on ROGD or um, Wakefield publishes um, that the misleading paper that led everyone to believe that there's a connection between vaccination and autism, once people need to realize that one study doesn't say anything and that we should listen to what scientists say are the consensus and stop relying on outlier studies and outlier um, researchers. Yeah, yeah, I, I, I completely want to echo what uh, Julia was saying. We have um, a science journalism problem writ large, and a lot of these issues are really systemic, um, and I think unfortunately require a pretty systemic overhaul in how journalism works today. Um, just the timeline that a lot of reporting works on. Um, if you're someone that gets reached out to by journalists, you know that they need a quote within that day to get an article out that day for some work that they're probably doing part-time or as a freelancer that is not sustaining their living and so that they can't put their best care into reporting and researching. Um, a lot of editors are strapped in slightly different ways, but they, as a result of being overextended and not having enough support or writers on staff, they reach for their one trans reporter for everything from trans people in sports to detransition to scientific reporting and all the way down. And a lot of times those people, however skillful they are in writing about one or two trans issues, they might not be uh, an expert in all of those issues. Um, in my field, social psychology, we had a whole crisis in the early 2010s called Replegate, which was just when uh, a bunch of really high profile uh, psychological studies, everything from like power posing to a lot of studies about bias and all kinds of other things, uh, couldn't be replicated by other scientists. They were really sexy studies in the sense that they got a lot of reporting. They were really appealing to the public. Science journalists loved them, but they didn't understand the underlying methods and statistical quirks that could lead to getting a lot of false positives or getting a lot of studies that can't be reproduced by anyone else. And we're going to just keep seeing that problem with trans healthcare, with any number of other healthcare uh, issues and science issues being reported on until we actually invest in journalism as a really careful practice and invest in our science journalists. This is a conversation I say about bad autism reporting all the time. Um, and solving that is, is a lot deeper of a problem, unfortunately. I love the connections that you're all making to these larger systemic issues as well. This is how I've always tried to talk about trans politics is that it is about us, but also it keys into issues that affect everybody. So here, you know, the crisis in journalism or the ways in which journalism has been misled or sometimes part of the problem with the pandemic or with reporting on autism that, it, you know, it's all sort of this lattice work or ball of wax, if you prefer. So another question from the audience, uh, one that I think is particularly important. Any guidance for how we can speak to progressive friends who have been swayed by anti-trans media coverage who may be starting to swerve towards uh, trans exclusionary territory? I mean, for me, I think it's about recognizing the ways in which a lot of those turf points are wrapped up in a in a thin veneer of progressivism, but are in fact like deeply right wing. Um, if you look at the so-called radical feminism being peddled by a lot of turfs, the protecting women and girls stuff, it is deeply, deeply biologically deterministic. And what it says is that all women are fragile little flowers who can't take care of themselves. And all men are big, scary predators. And a woman needs one good man to protect her from all the bad men. And like, that's not a feminist viewpoint. That's Victorian women shouldn't read, you know, because it'll give them the vapors stuff. It's, it's, they prey on your anxieties and they prey on your fears. And they prey on your feeling that like, maybe nobody's listening to me. Maybe nobody understands the trauma I've been through or isn't taking it seriously. And maybe if I give room to someone else, the space that I need to process my own oppression will be taken away. I'm talking specifically about turf stuff just because I come from a feminist background and I can sort of see the ways in which the tools of feminine, feminine, ugh, feminism have been corrupted to, you know, make these 
deep down lizard brain appeals to people's worst selves. But if you actually look at what this ideology wants, it is a purely biologically deterministic society wherein the heterosexual white nuclear family rules all. And there is absolutely no way that's good for trans people, but there's absolutely no way it's good for anybody, right? Like that's, it, it, it's an ugly, ugly world. And trans people, because there aren't that many of us and because our experiences are still somewhat misunderstood, it's easy to sell that worldview using us as the tipping point, but it's always going to go further and it's always going to take away whatever you think you have, whatever safety you think you have from these people, you don't have it. Yeah, um, I can kind of approach this from, you, you just kind of spoke to how do you reach progressives. Um, you know, I come from, everyone in my family is conservative, everyone in my family voted for Trump, so I kind of can talk to the perspective of people who are swayed to that movement, not through a radical feminist lens or a progressive concern trolling lens, but maybe a more conservative one. Um, and because uh, I think, you know, reaching reaching them to the extent you can reach them at all is is different and difficult. And in an earlier life, my my I was a political psychologist. That's what I studied in, in graduate school was how to open people's minds to information that goes against their viewpoints. And I stopped studying that because the, the research was so dismal and it's such a hard thing to do. But I think one thing that you can do with that kind of crowd is really um, kind of flip some of the narratives that uh, conservatives who are anti-trans have on its head and and really gently question why are these people so obsessed with what people just do maybe not with their own bodies as a phrasing because that has kind of liberal connotations now but like why are these people so obsessed with somebody else exercising their freedom why are they being so weird and and butthurt by the existence of this group of people you know like the right has very much a narrative of left and liberal people as being very sensitive and obsessed with you know controlling what other people want to do and um, having misplaced focus and being easily offended. So sometimes you can kind of twist that a little bit um, on its head for conservative people who aren't committed transphobes, but who have that kind of baseline discomfort or unfamiliarity with this stuff and get them really thinking about, oh, why do I care about this? This person is just a human being. That person's my neighbor and they're fine and they're all right and they helped me jump my car one time. Um, that kind of appeal is just a fellow human being exercising their freedom um, and their neighbor and someone they can know that tends to be a little bit more successful than any kind of um, appeal to like common values or some kind of higher order argument that might work with progressives. Uh, but it's tough. It's really tough. Um, and it's a question I, I hesitate uh, to answer because um, it can feel really dismal sometimes. Um, yeah. And Julia, really quickly to take us home. Sure. Yeah. Um, one of the things I've been doing more in my writing is moving away from just talking about like, you know, this is how we fight transphobia to thinking about how prejudice works in a general sense and articulating some of the unconscious mindsets that we have that kind of tend to lead us um, to towards certain ends. And one thing that I've written about on multiple pieces on Medium, especially with regards to grooming and social contagion, is there's this idea that uh, stigmatized groups are contagious and contaminating and corrupting. And this comes up over and over and over again. Obviously, there aren't enough time. There's not enough time left to make a lot of parallels here. But with regards to trans people, I think a lot of what's going on is people are worried that like trans people are corruptive force that are maybe we're canceling people, maybe we're um, you converting young children, grooming young children into being trans. And I think that that's a lot of why. Not only is this compelling, but it's why we talk a lot about the the turf to fascist pipeline, meaning that once people kind of go down a turf rabbit hole, it's really easy for them not only to like to go to, to buy into a lot of different kind of fascist things, whether it's anti-Semitism or um, and so on. So I think talking to them about unconscious biases and how the anti-trans movement plays into that would be another angle in addition to what both um, Jude and Devin said. Yes, I think it's very important to recognize that you could just sort of mad lib a lot of these narratives with things that have been said specifically about Jewish people, black people, Asians, cisgender, gays, lesbians, and bisexual people down the years. And that can sometimes get people to step back and go, oh, wait, this really is just sort of paint by numbers, isn't it? But uh, yes, 
we'll have to leave it there as we are at time. I want to thank the three of you. Uh, I have read your work, uh, all of your work. Um, some of it is on my bookshelf. Uh, Devin, I've loved your, your blog in particular. It's been, it spoke to me more than once. And so it's great to be on a panel with you all, sharing your insights and being a part of this wonderful discussion. And thank you to Medium as well for hosting it. So with that, I bid you all adieu.